Good evening and welcome to NTD News. I'm Stephanie Cox. Here are today's top stories. Inflation is a top concern for voters, both Republican and Democrat. But one expert says many Democrat leaders are out of touch and focusing on the wrong issues. Is a global food crisis on the way? The UN now warning of an unprecedented wave of hunger and destitution. We delve deeper on the issue with one of America's leading food brands. Former President Donald Trump fires back at last night's January 6th hearing. What is he saying about the allegations and how's President Biden reacting? Monkeypox spreads to the U.S. military and the Biden administration is ordering half a million doses of the monkeypox vaccine. Inflation is on the rise again. After a small dip in April, new data from May reveals an inflation surge higher than expected. Here's NTD's Melina Weiskup with a breakdown on today's data and what the president is, has to say about it. No good news for your pocketbook today with latest inflation data showing consumer prices are up 8.6% from a year ago. That's the biggest yearly increase since December of 1981. The president today telling the American people that he understands their pain. I understand Americans are anxious and they're anxious for good reason. Here's where the highest costs are. Meats cost anywhere from 10 to 17 percent more, and milk is nearly 16 percent more expensive. Housing is up 5.5 percent, and your vacation this year could cost nearly double your normal amount, with airline fees up nearly 38 percent. So how long will you have to pay more for these household items? Anywhere from six months to a year to a year and a half. Core inflation, which excludes food and energy, jumped 0.6 percent month over month. As for gas prices, 60 cents higher than last month, nearly $2 more than a year ago. The Saudis raised their prices for oil they're selling to Asia. That tells me I don't really see relief in the near term. President Biden today continuing to push the same messaging that we've heard all year, pinning blame on Putin and U.S. oil companies. They talk about how we have, they have 9,000 permits to drill. They're not drilling. I'm doing everything in my power to blunt Putin's price hike. But experts tell NTD the White House can do more to lower the price at the pump. Uh, At these prices, I think it's fair to say oil companies are trying to produce. It makes business sense. They also are trying to produce natural gas. But you have to get it to market. And so the administration has to be transparent about whether they're also approving permits and licenses for pipelines. The Federal Reserve has raised interest rates to 1%. What's certain here is that the Federal Reserve will continue to raise interest rates in a bid to slow inflation. But what's uncertain and the question lingering for many is whether or not we've seen the peak of inflation. Reporting in Washington, D.C., Melina Weiskopf, NTD News. We certainly hope those prices come down as soon as they can. And according to a recent poll, inflation is the most important issue in the minds of Americans, with criminal gun violence being the second highest concern. As the midterm elections ramp up, NTD's Arlene Richards spoke to a political analyst to find out what's happening on the ground. As Americans face some tumultuous times, issues like abortion, gas prices and mass shootings are taking center stage. But in this midterm election, who wins may not depend on whether they're Republican or Democrat, but rather what their stance is on inflation. A June 8th Quinnipiac poll shows that 34 percent of Americans think inflation is the most urgent issue facing the country. Political analyst Nicholas Giordano tells NTD how things look on the ground. What are some of the key issues on the minds of Republicans? The key issue on the minds of Republicans is going to be the gas prices, the food prices, and inflation. It's driving everything right now. Americans are struggling. And I think the secondary issue is going to be crime and the border. He thinks President Joe Biden is losing his influence and Democrats are focusing on the wrong issues. I think that many Democrats are getting frustrated that he can't come out and take control of the issue that he's not speaking more forcefully on how he's going to bring down gas prices. And as far as the Democrat leadership goes, it shows that they're out of touch with the American people because many Democrat leadership actually support the high gas prices. And former President Donald Trump is still getting high approval rates amongst Republicans. 
But what about criminal violence involving guns? Raising the age from 18 to 21 with uh, certain weapons, I don't think that's going to have any effect on this election cycle. Again, people are going to be voting for their personal economy. And the further we move out from the Uvalde shooting, the less of an interest people are going to have. According to the Quinnipiac poll, gun violence is the second biggest concern on the minds of Americans. Arlene Richards, NTD News, New York. And amid inflation and the recent slew of shootings, Americans may be wondering if they'll have to contend with a food shortage this year. Just this week, the U.N. Secretary General Antonio Guterres warned of an unprecedented wave of hunger and destitution around the world. Earlier today, I spoke with the CEO of a leading U.S. food brand, Goya's Robert Unane, to learn more. Robert, thanks for coming on. Glad to have you on the show. Thank you, Stephanie. It's great to be on with NTD. The UN chief's recent warning of a food crisis builds on concerns that were already growing. Do you foresee a food crisis this year? And if so, what do you think it'll look like? Yes, I, I do see a food crisis uh, because of several reasons. Uh, one is that we've given up our independence with oil. You know, we had we were halfway towards getting a Keystone pipeline. Uh, a lot of uh, drilling that we can do. And we decided to give our uh, resources away. Uh, the war in Ukraine also has exacerbated the crisis because between Ukraine and Russia, they have 50% of the world's uh, fertilizer, 30% of the world's uh, wheat, and 20% of the world's corn. We have our natural resources, food, uh, oil, military might, and quite honestly, we've given up our place as the world's protector of the innocent. We've given up our place as a large producer of, of oil from oil independence. Forty some percent of the cost of farming is in diesel and in fertilizer. So if these costs have tripled or quadrupled or doubled, then the cost for the farmer has gone way up and either the farmers go out of business or those costs are put forward. The other thing that's happening is that every day we have more mouths to feed with our borders wide open. So, you know, we are going to have trouble feeding ourselves. We're the biggest consumers on the planet. Yes. What can businesses and consumers here in the U.S. do to soften the blow or prepare? As consumers, the only thing that we can do, because our hands are tied and we are put in chains by this, is to consume less, to consume more nutritious. This isn't a sales pitch, but one of our biggest items is beans and rice. Most of the Latino community eats one form of beans and rice or others. We say as Latinos, we're united by language, we're separated by the bean. Everybody has their favorite bean. But, but here's the thing. Beans have protein, fiber, antioxidants, phytonutrients. When you combine it with rice, you get a complete protein. So it's a protein, it's a complete meal that's a substitute for other proteins and it's economical. When we put America first, we can defend ourselves. We won't be in chains. We won't be subjugated to other countries who are fending for themselves. Again, India, they're not exporting anything, they're keeping it for themselves. China's trying to buy our land for food, to control food. If you control the food, if you control the oil, if you control the military, which seems to be weaker every day, and then we're fighting amongst ourselves, we're hating and destroying, we're dividing, which is communism, and it's moving away from God. That is what's happening to us. And it's it's the downfall. It really is a downfall. Robert, your company, despite the challenges of the pandemic and, and the war and the coming food shortage and all of these challenges, your company is actually expanding. Could you tell us a little more about that? Well, we never stopped working with the pandemic. You know, the other thing that that the government has done, not just in the United States, but around the world, is to put people out of work, to incentivize people not to work. 
And in the United States, we did it by doubling our, our salaries. They were paying roughly $16 an hour, the government, which is double the minimum wage or more, to stay home and not work. As a company, we're growing. We never stopped working. In the year of the pandemic, we donated four and a half million pounds of food to pantries, to other countries across the United States and, and around the globe. So the fact that we are working and we have a reason to get up every day, God, family, work, we start every day uh, giving thanks to God for what we have. And that is why we are able to grow and expand. We're also expanding to meet the need of this growing food crisis. Next week, we'll be uh, inaugurating an expansion in Chicago, where we've been for more than half a century. And that facility uh, is part of a global expansion in the Caribbean, in Europe, across the United States. And as a company who is proud to be part of the second largest Latino country in the world, and soon to be the Latino will be the biggest group. And importantly, the Latino community is a hardworking and faith-based community. And we cannot lose that. We have to work. There's value in work. We have to move closer to God. Of course, there's value in that. God has given us this life and created the universe in seven days biblically in, uh, in this war. Russia had threatened that they could destroy Europe in 30 minutes. So what God has created, we can destroy. We've learned to destroy. We really have not progressed in this world with the division hatred. We need to love and move, unite and move closer to God. Robert Unanue, thank you. Thank you. And over to Africa. We have more updates on the attack on a Catholic church that left at least 40 people dead in Nigeria over the weekend. Nigerian officials say an Islamic terrorist group is responsible for it. The group is known as Islamic State West Africa Province. The terrorist group has carried out many attacks in other parts of Nigeria. But this was the first attack of terrorism linked to the group in the country's southwest. The region has not traditionally been a high-risk area for attacks. This has raised fears that terrorism is spreading in the country. Several men set off explosives and opened fire at the St. Francis Catholic Church in a city called Owo on Sunday, toward the end of the service. State officials say the death toll is at least 40. And back in the U.S., heated reactions on last night's January 6 hearing. Former President Donald Trump refutes allegations by a top committee member, while President Joe Biden also chimes in. NTD's Iris Tao has more. Footage and testimony played at the first primetime January 6 hearing have drawn mixed reactions. Democrats say they have laid out facts about former President Donald Trump's role in what they call an insurrection. This is his own attorney general, the White House counsel, his daughter. But the person in the center of the spotlight is firing back. Making a flurry of posts on Truth Social, Trump accused the panel of being a, quote, political witch hunt. He also reacted to some of the most high-profile testimonies at the hearing, including one from his daughter. I respect Attorney General Barr, um, so I accepted what he said, was saying. Ivanka Trump said she agreed with former Attorney General Bill Barr that the 2020 election was not stolen. But Trump said Friday that Ivanka was, quote, not involved in looking at or studying election results, adding that he has, quote, never wavered one bit about what he thought of the election outcome. Mike Pence, quote, deserves it. Trump also refuted the claim made by Representative Liz Cheney at the hearing that he backed the phrase hang Mike Pence, calling it fake news. Meanwhile, President Biden, while saying he did not watch the hearing, had this to say on Friday. It's important to the American people to understand what truly happened and to understand that the same forces that led January 6th remain at work today. Meanwhile, Democrats say more is to come for future hearings. The details that we will be able to fill in with subsequent hearings will um, be as compelling, I believe, as last night's hearing was. 
And after the first hearing, the second and third January 6 hearings are slated for Monday, June 13th and Wednesday, June 15th, respectively. And while an official schedule for the rest of them has not been announced, they're expected to be held throughout June and wrap up in September, right before the November midterms. Reporting in Washington, D.C., Iris Tao, NTD News. And staying on the Hill, Congressman Jim Jordan, the ranking member of the House Judiciary Committee, is accusing the FBI of purging employees with conservative views. He wrote a letter to FBI Director Christopher Wray earlier this week. The congressman says six FBI agents have come forward to him. They told him that the FBI took retaliatory actions against them for disagreeing with the agency's interpretation of the January 6th Capitol breach. Some whistleblowers say they had their security clearances suspended. And the FBI allegedly determined that they had espoused conspiratorial views. Jordan's letter redacted the names of the whistleblowers. He says his committee is conducting oversight to ensure the FBI is not retaliating against employees for exercising their First Amendment rights. In an email to the Epic Times, the FBI said under no circumstances would we take action against employees for lawfully exercising their First Amendment rights. And in health news, the U.S. military reported its first case of monkeypox at a base overseas. And the federal government is ramping up efforts to buy more monkeypox vaccines. Gay men still appear to be the most affected by the disease. That's according to the World Health Organization. And just a warning, some viewers may find the following images disturbing due to their graphic nature. Here are the details. A spokesperson for the U.S. European Command told CNN on Friday that they identified the first case of monkeypox in an active duty service member based in Stuttgart, Germany. The individual is currently isolating off base. The spokesperson says, quote, public health officials have determined that the risk to the overall population is very low. An official from the Department of Health and Human Services said on Friday that the federal government is buying more monkeypox vaccines. A two-dose vaccine known as Genius is approved in the U.S. The government has 72,000 Genius doses and is ordering 500,000 more doses from its manufacturer, Bavarian Nordic, which is based in Denmark. 300,000 of the doses will arrive over the next several weeks and the rest later this year. Meanwhile, a World Health Organization official said on Thursday that most monkeypox patients don't need new treatments like vaccines. When it comes to treatment, most people don't need the new products. Most people don't have a severe case of monkeypox and can be managed conservatively with regular care. Where it's necessary, it may be possible to access the new treatments for very select few patients who may need them. The CDC has confirmed 45 cases of monkeypox within the U.S. as of Thursday. They are in 15 states and D.C. The agency also confirmed over 1,300 cases in about 30 countries outside areas in Africa where the virus is endemic. Reporting by Allison Lee, NTD News. And on the CCP virus, the Biden administration is lifting the requirement for travelers that they must test negative for COVID-19 one day before boarding a flight to the U.S. Travel industry groups and airlines have been saying that customers are putting off international travel because of the strict testing requirements needed to enter the U.S. Scientific experts are also saying that testing before flights no longer makes sense. COVID-19 is already highly prevalent in the U.S. regardless of vaccination. The CDC said it will reinstate the testing requirement if a new dangerous variant emerges. And coming up, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis is not only attracting police officers to the Sunshine State, he's attracting police dogs as well. The governor signed a bill that supports service dogs after they retire from law enforcement. And voters in Michigan are suing Secretary of State Jocelyn Benson. She allegedly allowed private money to influence the administration of the 2020 elections. That and more here on NTD News. NTD's Capital Report. It's about getting answers. Cutting through the fog of politics. It's about your questions and our chances to ask. What is the net impact of the American Carson Graves? Thank you for joining us. We're speaking to those in power to find out what does this mean for the people. We're here 
so you are in the know. As Florida Governor Ron DeSantis continues to attract police officers to move to Florida, now police dogs may soon start looking for work there too. DeSantis just signed a bill that will help pay the medical bills for retired police dogs. NTD's Jason Perry has the story. Police dogs who retire from Florida's law enforcement agencies won't have to worry about their future medical bills, or at least their owners won't. On Friday, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis signed Senate Bill 226, establishing the Care for Retired Police Dogs program. The program will provide a reimbursement of up to $1,500 of the annual veterinary costs for a retired police dog. Uh, what we're saying in Florida is, is we're going to step up, uh, we're going to provide support for these canines, and I think it's going to be fantastic. I think you're going to see people lining up to be able to adopt these guys, and, uh, and they're going to be able to live, uh, live good retirements because they've earned it, and uh, we're proud to be able to be here to support it. And we wouldn't be able to do this uh, if we didn't have... Uh, advocates uh, like Emma. Emma has a nonprofit called Emma Loves Canines, and she also wants to be a canine officer. As soon as I learned about the lack of funding for retired police dogs, I wanted Emma Loves Canines to assist their handlers with food and medical expenses. When I heard that Mr. Killebrew had introduced the bill to support retired dogs, I knew that I had to reach out to him. I wanted to help pass the bill in any way I could. Representative Sam Killebrew, who introduced the bill, also spoke. These dogs are beat up after they've served, so they, they need uh, medical attention, and this money will go a long way to help them. Thank you. All right. For a retired service dog to qualify, the dog must have served for at least five years, or just three years if the dog was injured in the line of duty. Jason Perry, NCD News, New York. And over to Alaska, which is facing a string of election races unlike any other. It features a top four primary and a ranked choice voting general election. Here are the details. Voters in Alaska will have until the end of this week to vote in an unprecedented nonpartisan primary race. Under a new top four system, all candidates will appear on the same ballot with their affiliations listed next to their names. But only the top four runners will proceed to an August general election. That race will use ranked choice voting. A nonpartisan primary means there could be multiple candidates from the same party running in the general election. This could lead to interesting Republican on Republican and Democrat on Democrat races. It also means parties may not be able to replace a candidate should one withdraw. So far, some 100,000 ballots have been returned by mail. More than 160 communities also have access to on-site or early voting. This year, only one of Alaska's 60 seats in the Congress is up for grabs. This special election looks to fill the vacancy of Representative Don Young, who passed away in March of this year. A total of 48 candidates are vying for the seat. 16 of them are Republicans, 6 are Democrats, and 22 are running as nonpartisan or with undeclared affiliations. Top GOP runners include Sarah Louise Palin, a former Alaska governor and 2008 vice presidential candidate. Nick Begich, a businessman from a political family of prominent Democrats, former state lawmaker John Coghill, and Tara Sweeney, a co-chair of Young's campaign and former assistant secretary of the Interior. On the Democratic side, North Pole City Councilman Santa Claus and former legislator Mary Peltola have gained name recognition. And orthopedic surgeon Al Gross is the higher profile of the independents. 26 of the 48 candidates also filed to run in the regular House election, held on the same day as the special general election on August 16th. A separate set of regular general elections will be held in November. Michigan voters are suing Secretary of State Jocelyn Benson over 2020 election issues. She's accused of allowing Mark Zuckerberg to influence elections with tens of millions in donations. Let's zoom in on that. Voters in Michigan have taken their Democratic Secretary of State Jocelyn Benson to the State Court of Appeals. She's said to have violated the state's constitution and election laws during the 2020 elections. The lawsuit follows a recent lower court ruling where voters lack standing to sue Benson. 
The appeal states that Benson allowed the Michigan election process to be corrupted by an influx of private money selectively intended to promote voting among urban, Democrat-leaning voters, with a consequent dilution of the votes of rural, Republican-leaning voters. In the 2020 election cycle, billionaire Mark Zuckerberg and his wife Priscilla Chen managed to pump more than $400 million in donations into nonprofits. That money was nicknamed Zuckerbucks or Zuckbucks. Of it, $350 million went to the left wing Center for Technology and Civic Life, or CTCL. The rest was given for the Center for Election Innovation and Research. These grants were expected to be spent on COVID-19-related personal protective equipment, but instead CTCL reportedly gave them to more than 2,500 election offices nationwide. It required that local officials use the money to promote mail-in voting or to deposit ballots in unattended ballot boxes. According to the filing, of the almost $17 million CTCL spent in Michigan, at least 84 percent was expressly earmarked for urban jurisdictions that historically cast ballots for Democrats by a wide margin over Republicans. Voters say there is evidence that Benson encouraged local election administrators to participate in the scheme. So she's accused of failing in her duty to oversee state elections. According to Ballotpedia, in 2020, Joe Biden won Michigan over Donald Trump by 50.6 to 47.8 percent, while in 2016, Trump was awarded a 47.5 percent to 47.3 percent victory over Hillary Clinton. Attorney Thor Hearn is a special counsel for the Thomas More Society. He explains that this case is not about relitigating the 2020 election. Rather, it is about making sure that these unfair and illegal activities cannot happen in any future election in Michigan. Benson's office declined to comment on the appeal. And on tax, now the IRS wants a piece of your side hustle. As long as you use a payments app, Uncle Sam will know about it. And TD's Phil Zoe has the story. If you have a side business where you make a little extra cash, beware. If you make over $600, all that will be reported to the IRS starting now by payment apps such as Venmo, Cash App, eBay, and more. And that's going to be a new challenge for folks who may not be used to reporting some of that income on their taxes. We're losing our freedoms. That people are going to have to start deleting uh, a Venmo in the apps. I have Venmo. I'm, I'm not going to use it. I'm going to delete it. Raul Rivera is a freelance driver in New York one of the many gig workers that this new law may impact. And Cash App, I was about to start to use Cash App. I'm not going to use it either. Rivera says he pays his taxes regardless, but doesn't like the government prying into his business. For him, it's a privacy issue. Right now, the only thing that I use is Zelle, and that's mostly to receive a couple of dollars when I need help from family members. I'm, a, I'm working here in New York City, and I'm struggling. The gas, the, the gas prices are, are through the roof. The tax law will apply for the 2022 tax year. Payment processors like Venmo will keep track of any users receiving $600 or more as income. When I got my first 1099 from PayPal uh, a couple years ago, I was honestly excited because it did such a beautiful job of outlining everything that I've made. Amber Temerity Lozi has been a freelance blogger for over six years. She has a more positive view on this new law. There are some people who try to skirt the system. Um, but I also think that there are people who just genuinely didn't realize that even if you're making under $600, even if you didn't receive a tax form, you still have to report. Besides income, Lozi says it will also help people track their expenses, which could come in handy. But the law does not apply to people paying back their friends for splitting a bill or for other personal uses. Garrett Watson, senior policy analyst at the Tax Foundation, explains. For example, uh, you're splitting the rent with someone or you're paying someone back for a meal that you split together or uh, you sold something for less than you bought it for. In none of those cases would you owe ta additional tax. And some bookkeeping advice. Receipts related to expenses, uh, making sure that you're taking advantage of all the deductions available to you when you do your taxes, that will help. Uh, mitigate some of this, um, some of this reporting changes when it comes to thinking about your your tax liability. Phil Zoe, NTD News. And if you have any news tips or feedback for the show, you can email us at eveningnews at ntd.com. And coming up, the Green Gator Bandit has been sentenced to four years in prison. He's responsible for a series of bank robberies in Southern California. 
And in the NFL, the Washington Commanders have fined their assistant coach $100,000 for political comments he made about the events of January 6th. Find out what he said when NTD returns. Hello, I'm Mike Lindell, and as you know, my passion is to help each and every one of you get the best sleep of your life. That's why I created my new Giza Dreams bed sheets. I started by using the world's best cotton called Giza. It's only grown in a region between the Sahara Desert, the Mediterranean Sea, and the Nile River. It's ultra soft and breathable, but extremely durable. I guarantee you they'll be the most comfortable sheets you'll ever own. I do not like my sheets. I love Mikey's a dream sheet. I'm interrupting this commercial to bring you my BOGO extravaganza. For example, you can buy one of my Giza Dream bed sheets and get a second set absolutely free. Or my six piece towel sets. Buy one set, get another one absolutely free. Or you can get my classic premium my pillow and get another one absolutely free. So call the number on your screen or go to mypillow.com. Use your promo code to get my buy one, get one free offers and get deep discounts on all my pillow products. Communism is evil. Come on. Listen, if you're as tired of the censorship as I am, I've actually got good news for you. Check out EpicTV.com. It's a brand new censorship-free video platform where you can find not only my show, but other deep documentaries, great programs, and honest movies that bring you the news without all the spin and the fake narratives. So I'll see you there. Navigating a world of economic madness you need to have the right guide. What do today's decisions mean for your tomorrow? We ask why, what's the alternative? Uncover the deeper reasons and the hidden influences and highlight the real opportunities for profit. At Entity Business, we connect the dots for you. Good evening. A man responsible for a string of robberies in Southern California has been sentenced to four years in prison. He's known as the Green Gator Bandit. 55-year-old Christopher Paul Daniels of Torrance was sentenced on Wednesday to three years and 10 months in federal prison. He admitted to robbing three banks in Orange County. The robberies date back to October 2021. Daniels was arrested in March. During the court hearing in April, he pleaded guilty to robbing a U.S. bank, a Chase Bank, and a Bank of the West. Authorities said Daniels was charged as a suspect in at least eight other robberies. The FBI called him the Green Gator Bandit because of the green camouflage gator face and neck covering he wore in some bank surveillance photos. He has also worn gators or a mask in other colors or designs during robberies. And the San Francisco Police Department has made multiple arrests related to a violent retail crime series that happened in the spring. All the suspects arrested are teenage juveniles, and the investigation is still ongoing. NTD's Jason Blair brings us the details. In San Francisco, multiple juveniles were arrested for an organized smash-and-grab crime spree that involved 10 different incidents, all happening within three weeks. Three of the suspects, aged 14, 15, and 16, are believed to be involved in all 10 of the thefts, which happened between March 18th and April 10th. All of the crimes happened in San Francisco, with some locations being hit more than once. Investigators say at least $21,000 worth of merchandise was stolen, and the suspects are facing multiple charges, including burglary, conspiracy, grand theft, organized retail theft, and assault and battery. Some of the suspects remain at large, and the cases are still active. Jason Blair, NTD News, San Francisco. Now to something more constructive, 3D printing. You may have heard of 3D printing being used to model prototypes like cars and buildings, but new advancements in the tech sector are leading to 3D printing of actual car parts. NTD's David Lamb reports on how these developments can change the automotive manufacturing process. Nearly 400 new electrical vehicle models are to be launched in the next eight years. The supply will need to keep up. 
That's where additive manufacturing, also known as 3D printing, comes in. In a 3D printing webinar on Thursday, experts explain the new production capacity of additive manufacturing. Typically what we say is anything that's about the size of your fist uh, or smaller and in volumes of three to 5,000 will work. DeLong says the quantity can increase as the size of the parts get smaller and as technology improves. Additive will take over a lot of this in the next probably 10, 12 years. He said additive manufacturing will help the industry since car sales are hindered due to shipping and parts shortages. Conventionally, many parts are made by cutting away material or injecting material such as plastic or metal into a mold to get the desired shape or texture. 3D printing, on the other hand, works by adding layers upon layers of material until the final object is completed. It has the potential to reduce cost and production time. So if you look at an automotive interior, if you look at all the plastic parts in there, a very, very large majority are going to have some sort of texture applied to them. There are various final touches, such as fine grain or leather grain, which Kramer says is costly from injection, but comes as a feature through 3D printing. These touches can improve the look of the final product, making it identical to standard manufacturing. Is this 3D printed or injection molded? It's very difficult to see. My boss will come by and he'll come and he'll find that part and he'll find the injection molded part that it matches. And he always has to ask me, wait, Wes, which one of these are 3D printed? Which one's injection molded? So that's really what it's all about right there. The experts say they expect additive manufacturing to change the way parts are designed, built, and distributed. David Lamb, Entity News, California. And in the NFL, the Washington Commanders have fined assistant coach Jack Del Rio $100,000 after he called the events of January 6th a dust-up and compared them to the rioting that happened in the summer of 2020. It started on Monday when Del Rio replied to a tweet regarding the January 6 hearings and asked why the summer of riots, looting, burning, and the destruction of personal property is never discussed. When asked about it Wednesday, Del Rio said in part, I can look at images of the, on the TV, people's livelihoods are being destroyed, businesses are being burned down, no problem. I just think it's kind of two standards. Del Rio later apologized for calling January 6th a dust-up, but stood by his comments condemning violence. And in basketball, Forbes recently valued NBA superstar LeBron James' net worth at more than a billion dollars. Now, the four-time NBA champion says he'd like to own a team someday, and he's even picked out what city will house it. Here are the details. There's always things that you can do differently. Four-time NBA MVP LeBron James has said for years he'd like to own an NBA franchise when he retires. Now the 37-year-old has even gone so far as to say where he wants it, Vegas. James, who's already a minority owner of the Boston Red Sox and Liverpool FC, made the revelation on his talk show, The Shop. Turning his revelation into a reality won't be easy, though. Active NBA players aren't allowed to be owners, and though he's recently joined the Billionaires Club, he would likely need some outside financing to help him. The last NBA team to be sold was the Minnesota Timberwolves, which fetched $1.5 billion in 2021, and they're at the low end of the price range. Forbes recently valued the NBA's 30 franchises and only the Memphis Grizzlies and New Orleans Pelicans ranked below Minnesota in terms of estimated value. For perspective, the New York Knicks topped the list at just under $6 billion. Even if James was in the running to purchase a team, though, a common stipulation for a sales agreement is to keep the franchise where it is. No relocation. James's more likely option is to wait until the league expands, despite the official uncertainty. NBA Commissioner Adam Silver has officially said there's no current plans to do so, though rumors have circulated that the league is quietly looking into it with Seattle and Las Vegas as their primary option. The NBA's last expansion team was the Charlotte Bobcats, now known as the Hornets, which entered the league in 2004. Coming up, Beijing threatened Washington with a war over Taiwan. This when China and U.S. defense chiefs met face to face for the first time. And we'll be hearing from the head of a new project in the U.K. that's upholding the law to protect freedom of expression. Stay tuned for more when we come back on NTD News.
Innovation Speaks, we don't just scratch the surface. We want to go wide and deep. Our viewers come away with a much richer understanding of the issues of the day. We really make a big effort to bring on different voices onto the show. We don't just talk to experts and newsmakers, which of course are extremely important, but we also want to hear from the American people. So the people who are impacted by the policies and issues that we're talking about, because what they have to say is just as important to the national conversation. Current defense chiefs for the U.S. and the Chinese Communist Party are meeting face-to-face -face for the first time. Their Friday discussion grabbed a lot of attention over talk about Taiwan. The CCP went so far as to threaten war over the island. Here's what they said. According to China's defense spokesman General Wei Fenghe said, quote, If anyone dares to split Taiwan from China, the Chinese army will definitely not hesitate to start a war, no matter the cost. After the meeting, Wei was asked about the meeting with U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin. He said it went smoothly. A U.S. statement issued after the talks says Austin called on the regime to refrain from further destabilizing actions on Taiwan. He also reaffirmed the importance of peace and stability across the Taiwan Strait and opposition to unilateral changes to the status quo. China claims self-ruled Taiwan as its own territory and has increased military activity near the island over the past two years. The communist regime has never ruled out taking Taiwan by force. The United States is Taiwan's most important supporter and arms supplier. This is a source of friction between Washington and Beijing. Austin and Wei met on the sidelines at the Shangri-La Dialogue in Singapore. It's a meeting that attracts top-level military officials, diplomats, and weapons makers from around the globe. The Chinese Communist Party has always kept a tight grasp on what its citizens can view online. But now Beijing's long arm could be influencing opinion abroad as well, through Google, YouTube, and other sites you may use all the time. NTD's Chenny Wu has the details. China has exploited Google, YouTube, and other Western search engines on sensitive topics, including Xinjiang and COVID-19, asserting their narrative to American audiences. That's according to a new report from the Brookings Institution and the Alliance for Securing Democracy. The study, conducted over a four-month period, found that new searches for Xinjiang resulted in Chinese state-backed sources in the top 10 results 88% of the time. Chinese state media typically deny the genocide of ethnic Uyghurs in the region, which the U.S. State Department considers a crime against humanity. There was also a high volume of state-run sources and searches for conspiratorial terms. For example, a YouTube search for Fort Detrick, where Beijing claims COVID-19 originated, on average saw half of the results from Chinese state media. That means anyone unfamiliar with these topics could end up learning about them from Chinese propaganda. So how did Chinese state media become so prevalent in search results? The study says it could be the sheer volume of content produced by China. In the past decade, Beijing has invested heavily in its global media presence under communist leader Xi's goal of telling China's story well. For example, though COVID-19 was a top topic for all global media in 2021, the study says it received disproportionate attention from Chinese diplomats and state media, and that hashtag COVID-19 and hashtag Xinjiang were the two most frequently used hashtags on Twitter by all official Chinese accounts in 2021. The report calls for transparency in the algorithms used by Google and other search engines, so people would know how they determine and rank their results. Google did not respond to a request for comment. The researchers say that Beijing uses its state publications to disseminate their preferred, often distorted narratives around strategic issues through their own accounts. The report also warns that the findings likely underestimate Beijing's influence in search results because there are many sources not officially affiliated with but backed by the communist regime, and they regularly republish the regime's narratives. Chenny Wu, NTD News. And in the UK, in January 2019, former British officer Harry Miller was contacted by Humberside police after he tweeted a limerick that was critical of transgender people. Even though no crime had been committed, the police recorded the post as a non-crime hate incident. 
He's since won a legal challenge with the Court of Appeal ruling that the police guidance was wrongly used and had a chilling effect on his freedom of speech. He's now launched the Bad Law Project to help others who find themselves in the same situation. Here's NTD's Jane Werrell with more. These are all Goliaths, and we're all Little Davids. Just down the road from the Royal Courts of Justice, actor and leader of the Reclaim Party, Lawrence Fox, and former police officer Harry Miller launched the Bad Law Project. Miller won a legal challenge last year against a national policy that classified certain views on gender as non-crime hate incidents. Now he wants to stand up for others in similar situations. I tweeted gender critical views. I said that trans women are not women, that no woman um, ever has a penis. And I famously retweeted a, a feminist limerick. And uh, the attitude of the police was that this, this didn't break any law, but it did go against their guidance. The mere fact of being recorded as a non-crime criminal caused me sleepless nights because that is the logical response when the state gangs up on you and accuses you of not having committed a crime but being a non-crime criminal nonetheless it blows your head we are right in the we are right into orwellian territory and in my case the judge said we have never had a stasi a checker or a gestapo we do not live in an orwellian society and the bad law project is here to make that so. We do not want to live with a politicised police force. We want to live as free people under the rule of law and not be shackled by the chains of guidance. The project is supporting commentator and GB News presenter Calvin Robinson, who said his ordination to the priesthood was blocked because of his views. I personally was cancelled from the Church of England for not subscribing to the idea that this country or the church indeed itself, is institutionally racist. And I see many elements of racism in our society, many, many individuals who are racist and need to be held to account for such nastiness and ignorance. But that doesn't make the country racist, nor does it make the church racist. I think these assumptions are baked in critical race theory, which is an ideology imported from America that has been debunked. And that is actually quite toxic and divisive and should not be applied over here. However, people are applying it. People are using it to get their own way, and it's wrong. Bad law should hopefully change that. Despite some here being cancelled, there was an atmosphere of optimism and determination. Jane Worrell, NTD News, London. Interesting project. And coming up, a showroom in Tuscany that displays memorabilia from movies attracts wealthy collectors from all over the world, many of whom come looking for a specialty item for their home. And in love and in their 90s, a couple married for 72 years have become a viral sensation. Find out more after the break. According to ancient Chinese medicine, purslane is considered a medicinal herb and is used to help lower cholesterol, improve vascular functions, and prevent diabetes. Perilla seeds can nourish the lungs and spleen. It is used to treat asthma and improve pulmonary functions. Puritan green vegetable omega-3 is made from purslane and perilla seeds from Huangmei Mountain in South Korea. It contains over 90% of omega-3, 6, 7, and 9, the highest concentration possible without chemical additives. The soft gel is made of natural seaweed it is 100% organic and vegan. Both adults and children can take it with peace of mind. Ancient recipes were passed down from heaven to bring prosperity and longevity. Puritan Green Vegetable Omega-3. If you're on the hunt for unique memorabilia, a showroom in Italy might have you covered. It attracts wealthy collectors from all over the world. They come looking for oddities or world-famous movie props to add to their home decor. NTD's Andrew Thomas brings us a closer look. Tom Holland's Spider-Man Far From Home mask looks out at an extraordinary collection of memorabilia. 
In the center of Arezzo, near Florence, is the Theatrum Mundi, a place filled to the brim with all kinds of collector's items. Our customer are people that want to put some strange things in his home, office, uh, yacht, uh, airplane, uh, society. So um, they want to have something really unique. Cableri left the legal profession to dedicate himself full-time to memorabilia. His clients are the rich and famous, who look to spend enormous sums of money to own objects that might have been the stuff of their childhood dreams. It's why the collection is private and can be visited only by appointment. Arezzo, this small city, doesn't have a, a big airport, so they <laughs> arrive in Florence, they take an, an helicopter to come in Arezzo, they stay here two, two hours, they buy and then they go. So uh, it's a very strange, uh, strange world. So. One of the most iconic items is the chopper bike from Easy Rider, originally owned by Dennis Hopper. Bianca Barbagli, Cableri's executive assistant, recalls her excitement when the bike first arrived. I grew up uh, as a teenager with this movie and it was so iconic and see, you know, we had to unpack in the street because it was so big, the truck that we couldn't we couldn't get the truck in front of the gallery, and so all the people stopped and looked at the bike. The gallery was considered worthy of the cover of National Geographic magazine some years ago. The publicity brought it to the center of attention and caught the eyes of many more collectors. Many tourists visit Arezzo to browse through the countless antique stores, but might be surprised to find it's home to some of the world's most iconic movie memorabilia. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. And back home in the U.S., a Texan couple still in love after 72 years of marriage are inspiring others to build lifelong relationships. Oh, people just, they want a love like theirs, you know, to like have a love that's lasted for so long. The couple's granddaughter, Jay Lee, shared a video of some adorable moments between the two. Love you, hon. It went viral. Before the video was taken, her grandmother was on pain medication from a broken pelvic bone and she was having an anxiety attack. The thing that calmed her was sitting in her husband's lap that day. And so we just thought, like, this is so cute, the world needs to see this. And then it just kind of blew up and people were like, I want to see more of them. Surprised by the huge response, Jay Lee decided to release some more endearing moments of her grandparents. The loving devotion of husband and wife had a heartwarming effect on one commenter. He said watching them made him just like know that he wanted to finally commit and propose to his girlfriends. Kenneth first met Faye back in 1949. Having left her home in Fred, Texas to study nursing in Beaumont, Faye rented a room in Kenneth's family home. It was love at first sight for both of them. Married in 1950, they then started a family. Kenneth became a fitter welder and Faye a registered nurse. Despite working hard, they always made time to enjoy life. They had a very good balance of, of all the things and, you know, checking all the boxes, making sure that they're happy as a couple, but also their children are happy and traveling. Their love for life and resolve to stay together through thick and thin hasn't faded away. They claim that the secret to their long-lasting happy marriage is respecting one another, having a lot of love in your family and doing things together. They always did put God first, and that's, that's a huge thing for our family as well, never giving up and working through. Communication is key. Laughing <laughs> is a, a big part of their marriage. They reminded people true love exists and are an inspiration to their family. They've always just been our best role models. Their house was always full of love. The public has commented on their videos and how they wish modern love could be more like this. Well, I think people just seem to give up too quickly these days. And you don't see a lot of people like talking about God, I guess, as much as you used to. And plus, they're so old school. Morals are way different than, than people these days. So I think it's like, I don't know. I would see young people comment on um, their videos and be like, well, the boys these days are nothing like the men in those days. So I guess that's a struggle for people is just the, the generations are just night and day from what they used to be. And so I think that that's the hardest thing that people probably struggle with is that, you know, there's not a lot of um, decency, I guess, like there was then. For Kenneth and Faye, who share four children, an adopted niece, 10 grandkids, and 22 great-grandkids, 
life is slowing down in their 90s. They are in a nursing home, which leads Jay Lee to reflect. I think that being like paying attention to your grandparents and making sure that they feel loved and not forgotten. Like that's just so important. People don't, life gets busy. I understand that. It's just important to continue keeping them close and making them feel important and being around them and because life is so short. A sweet story and one of many, I'm sure. And that's all for today's news. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Stephanie Cox. Thanks for watching us on YouTube. Did you know YouTube only keeps selective videos on its platform? So if you want to make sure you get the full picture, just subscribe to our newsletter. Go to newsletter.ntd.com and sign up. It's free.